To me, Global Reach Out is inspiring. It's connecting with God, reaching out to the world, and impacting life. The stories that I shared is so personal, and it deeply impacted me. Global Reach Out to me is reach out to the truth. Connecting hearts, connecting lives. You're listening to Global Reach Out. Hi there. I am Dr. Gilbert Suhu. Welcoming you back for the fifth episode of our series of talks on the topic, my work, career, and vocation. Previously, I explained our vocation in terms of showing common grace for the common good. I briefly alluded to Jesus' well-known parable about the Good Samaritan. Today, I will go into it in more detail. So it will be like a bubble study, but hopefully digestible. But let's first do some preliminary preliminary preparation before diving in. Uh, First of all, Jesus used a lot of parables to facilitate his teaching. Parables are short stories that are made up. That is, they are fictitious, yet realistic. That means the story could have happened back in Jesus' time. Being observant, he was very familiar with the culture, traditions, and practices of his contemporaries living and working in a primarily agrarian society. They were primarily farmers. The reason Jesus utilized the background that he shared with his listeners was for the sake of immediacy. By mentioning familiar scenes or situations, he easily and quickly triggered mental images in the minds of his audience. He eliminated the need for a long-winded description of the story setting, cast of characters, and their behavior. His, his, his listeners will automatically fill in the gap. It's like a comedian telling a joke. Unless the audience is familiar with the setting and assumptions behind the joke, they will fail to catch the force of the punchline. The intended humor falls flat and there's no laughter. So, too, so also with Jesus' stories, he wants to make an impression or impact. He wanted his audience to respond in a certain way. But why did Jesus tell stories? If he intended to teach profound truths, how can simple stories about ordinary life and people back then can communicate abstract and hard to understand ideas? After all, Jesus claimed to be the son of God who ruled an eternal kingdom. The kingdom was not of this earth and he wanted to describe what it was like being a subject of his rule. He was a king, but vastly different from any earthly king. We have to speculate because the Bible does not explain why. Jesus' strategy of storytelling leads to our second important factor. The people of his time only received the bare rudiments of an education. They were relatively uneducated compared to countries today that require their youth to go through years of schooling. Even though a number of people could read, reading material was not readily available unless you were well off because having scrolls was expensive and productions of these writings were done by hand. So only a limited number of copies were produced. Jesus' society was primarily oral. That is spoken language. Even students studying at rabbinic schools had to memorize their lessons without the aid of written notes. They would listen to the teacher's lectures and learn by repeating the lesson out loud. Thus, Jesus had to keep his lesson simple enough to follow and be understood. Given the spectrum of of any general audience where there's a range of intellectual ability and education, Jesus wanted to be sure everyone, from the most accomplished scholar like teachers of the law to the illiterate farmer, could understand this message. Thus, the best approach is to tell stories. Besides, all through history, including today, people enjoy stories that paint vivid mental pictures, stir the emotions, and leave a lasting impression. Consequently, Jesus told stories or parables, some of which are preserved in the Bible. Now we are ready to look at Jesus' parable or story of the Good Samaritan. Actually, he never described the character as good. It's a label given by modern readers, but but it is accurate and serves our purpose well. 
is recorded in the third gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through verse 37. Jesus told the story in response to a question posed by a teach, uh, expert of the law who asked, well, who is my neighbor? The lead up to his question was the early answer to Jesus' own question, what is written in the law? How do you read it? In reply, the expert gave the two greatest commandments that we talked about in earlier episodes. Jesus then told the expert to obey so that he might inherit eternal life. The expert thought that he had already inherited the promise and wanted confirmation by asking Jesus to identify the neighbor. Likely, he was confident that he loved his neighbor, namely fellow Jews, or more explicitly, fellow experts of the law, a very select group, a very narrow definition for neighbor. So Jesus' parable was intended to expand his definition to include much more as to who was his neighbor. But instead of telling him the definition directly, Jesus wanted him to figure it out on his own. As an excellent teacher, Jesus knew that if he, if he could get his student, the expert of the law, to think things through and draw his own conclusion, it would be much more convincing and memorable. Then he would be more likely, likely to expand his own definition and to see people in a new light. Jesus also knew the expert of the law was overconfident. So Jesus had to find a way to shake him out of his smugness by shocking him. Jesus did this by choosing the most outrageous example of a neighbor he could think of. Knowing the historical background of the hostility between Jews and Samaritans, Jesus deliberately chose the Samaritan. He knew that the expert would never view any Samaritan favorably. The social distance between the two groups was simply too wide and unbridgeable that it was inconceivable for the expert to agree to Jesus' position if he simply told him the answer. He needed convincing. The story drew him in so that he could picture what Jesus described. Jesus wanted him to feel and vicariously experience the Samaritan's compassion for the Jewish victim of a mugging in a remote place. It was dangerous with the threat of robbers. Coming from Jerusalem, we inferred that this traveler was Jewish, since no self-respecting Samaritan would ever enter the city. Jesus brings in two fellow travelers, a priest and a Levite, two elite members of Jewish society, knowledgeable about the law, just like the expert. Thus, we infer that Jesus wanted him to identify with these two. Yet in the story, those two ignore the victim, lacking compassion. So they were not neighborly, even toward a fellow Jew. We have to speculate on the expert's reaction to the behavior of his peers. Likely disappointment and perhaps some guilt as he himself may not have been so neighborly either. Then came the shock of hearing about the Samaritan coming to the rescue. The victim was a total stranger and the arch enemy Jew. Yet the Samaritan felt compassion and substantially helped him by treating his wounds, mounted him on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and paid for lodging until he recovered. All this amounted to significant cost to the Samaritan, time, money, and the possibility of being attacked when encumbered with the unconscious man. Yet the Samaritan did not hesitate, nor did he complain. He gave generously without expecting of recognition or compensation. At the conclusion of this story, Jesus pointedly asked the expert, which of these three, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert replied, the man who had sh showed mercy on him. Notice that the expert did not call the hero of the story Samaritan but the one who had mercy. He drew the conclusion Jesus wanted him to make. Then as the punchline, Jesus said, go and do likewise. Be a neighbor like the hero of the story to others. Even to those for whom you have no, no natural affinity uh, and may even have an adversity. If we label people in Jesus' day 
Jew or Samaritan, that tends to build barriers, preventing us from showing mercy, whether to a loved one, a stranger, or even the enemy. The concept of neighbor overcomes labels and categories that contribute to prejudice, which you see every new one within our reach as potential neighbors. Though it cost us as it did the Samaritan, we take stock of our resource sources. We identify potential barriers to compensate uh, compassion and mercy. We ask, what's stopping me? And more importantly, ask, who is my neighbor? What acts of compassion and mercy are called for? We hear Jesus' admonition, go and do likewise. The Good Samaritan did not look at the victim and thought Jew. Instead, he thought, here is an unfortunate human being in desperate need of help. I need to do something now. He took immediate action, figuring out the next step as he went along. Luckily, he quickly evaluated the situation before forming and executing his game plan. He got it done. The former victim was now safe and stood a good chance of recovering. Interestingly, the Samaritan left the man in the innkeeper's care until he returned. Perhaps the Samaritan continued on his journey to fulfill his business. Thus, this interlude was a few days interruption of his business trip. He was responsible for his own affairs as well as for the man. The proverbial Samaritan is our example and role model. Do we dare to follow in his footsteps? Throughout history, since Jesus' day, he is known as the Good Samaritan. Are we good neighbors? Will we go and do likewise? Will we dispense common grace for the common good? Next time, we will look at our own story and ask, who is my neighbor? But for now, I close episode five of our series on work, career, and vocation. Until then, have a safe and fulfilling day. Okay, some questions or comments for us to consider in response to this episode. Number one, who would be a contemporary Samaritan or Jew to you? Number two, do you think the Samaritan had personal limits as to how much help he would give? Number three, with the threat of being mugged, was the Samaritan foolish in exposing himself to danger as he helped the victim? The program is proudly presented by Global Reach Out. We welcome you to share our live enriching webcasts with family and friends through our website, global-reachout.org. Let's reach out to bless more lives together.